you in the in the Renaissance side where I'm picturing almost an Amish-like existence where we're all living in small homes by rivers, planting soybeans. You know, how do you do that with 300 million plus people here approaching 10 billion on the planet? How are we getting from here to there this small scale local existence that you see us all migrating from great or doomed cities like this one? Well, I wouldn't say that we're going to all go Amish or Amish, I guess. That's my Canadian Amish. accent. Forgive me, is it Amish? It's Amish. Amish. It's Amish. Named after a, a gentleman named Amon. That was his first name, Amon. He's a Swiss. But um, uh, I think that uh, what we're after here is uh, a recognition, really, of what reality is. It's not a question of whether you're a pessimist or an optimist. This, to me, has been a very false diversion. Uh, it's been a ruse, you know? We don't need to debate whether we're pessimists or optimists. Uh, it's a question of what's the reality. The reality is we are facing a, uh, uh, this comprehensive contraction. And so the task before us is to manage contraction. And the main part of that is to recognize that it is all a matter of scale. We have to, we have to uh, downscale all of these major activities uh, of daily life, including the way we construct the human habitat. And, uh, uh, but how do we get from here to there? That's the question. I mean, we how do is we, I, we, we start doing things like the architecture profession recognizes that it's not a good thing to put up 80-story buildings anymore. You know that we we need to form a new consensus out of this muddled, fractured uh, uh, set of arguments and and uh, battles that are going on. We need a new consensus, and one of them is. Maybe there is an optimum scale for what urbanism is going forward. And maybe it's not grandiose. Maybe it's not heroic, you know, but it's reality-based. Jim R., future of cities, do you see them contracting? Uh, well, we're seeing it. We're in a world where we actually have contracting cities. So Detroit is contracting. Expanding cities at the same time. I guess I don't see it quite such black and white, obviously, as Jim. Uh, and to me, skyscrapers are not the main thing to focus on. Uh, I mean, and you have gigantic Asian cities where it's like square miles of skyscrapers that make our little, you know, midtown look like not much of anything. But uh, I think things that we're going to end up with cities at a variety of scales. And I think part of uh, that has to do with the, I don't see us disconnecting this global economy that's really formed since the fall of the Soviet Union that operates at such a gigantic scale, I don't uh, see that disappearing. The other aspect is I respect what Jim has to say about shrinking, but basically it's not a message people want to hear. We need a little, uh, oh, I shouldn't give any respect. You know, I think we need to find a way to, people have aspirations, we have to connect they, especially in the developing world, where they really expect to uh, escape from poverty, and they're really looking for the road out of there. And uh, you know, part of our obligation as a developed world is to find those roads so that they're they have something to aspire to. That's your point, isn't it? I mean, isn't that wishful thinking on their part, or is it? Are, are we? The, is this the bitterness of an empire in decline? Because our money may be worth nothing, but the Chinese money is supposed to be going up. So, is this? Are you talking about a global phenomenon here? Obviously, we're talking resources. Yeah, absolutely. And the idea that globalism is a permanent feature of the human condition is absurd. <laughs> this is an idea that uh, Tom Friedman. Uh, put out there about 10, 15 years ago that this was now a permanent global economy. It's absurd. The global uh, economy must be understood in the following way. A transient set of economic relations that will change. Uh, and uh, it depends on things that are self-evidently not sustainable, like 12,000 mile supply lines for merchandise. So the idea that we're going to, you know, that that's going to persist is idiotic. And uh, uh, what, what I uh, propose is that we're going to see North America and the USA become a much more internally focused economy. And one of the important things that we do have to get uh, active about right away, you know, let's talk about some concrete action. 
We have to reactivate the inland waterway system of America and rebuild the waterfronts of the, the towns that are on the inland waterways. These are not the places, by the way, that are going to be subjected necessarily to you know, uh, sea level rises. But what we've been doing for the last 30 years is building festival marketplaces and rock and roll venues and condominiums on the waterfronts of these uh, uh, inland waterway towns. We need to re rebuild the infrastructure for commerce that takes place on the water. We need to rebuild warehouses. We need to put back the piers and the dry docks and the sleazy accommodations for the sailors. We're not talking about that at all. There's no conversation about that going on any more than there's a coherent conversation about rebuilding the railroad system in America. Okay, so I've made you, let's start with, say, Mayor of New York City. And, and you've got a you know, blank check. What do you do? Well, what, are, what are the things that you focus on now, given your worldview of where it's all going? I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, I think I, you know, I think the mayor's actually made a lot of progress. Don't say that with a blue card beside your name. I know. Well, <laughs> I'm actually not, I'm sort of that off not supposed to, you know, ever mention the mayor in my writing. Uh, the um, I, the limitations, shall we say, of the, you know, Bloomberg as a leader in uh, revitalizing cities is that Bloomberg, like a good politician, does not look outside the borders of the city. And uh, the New York metropolitan area, area is a sort of unified economic entity, no matter what anyone, whatever you think about the political boundaries. So you'd be doing what? You'd be calling so Governor words, Christie? We, it's they, they, among model. others, yes. Okay. Uh, but no, the, the region has to actually see that uh, it has to act in common uh, on a lot of different uh, ways, you know, having to do with climate change, among others. I mean, New York was better prepared for Hurricane Irene than New Jersey was because New York paid attention and New Jersey didn't. So what are you, does, what do you do? I don't know, what is your script then for how you're, you're preparing for the future of cities by creating, in, any, in many ways, a super region, much like you're against, aren't you? Sort of like having these regional economies where we would be coordinating more with New Jersey. Now Absolutely. Well, because it recognizes a reality that's already there. It already is an economy. We can't, we can't pretend it's not. I mean, we do pretend it's not, but it actually is. So if we don't act in concert as a region, then we, you know, we actually can't get anywhere in preparing ourselves for the future. Now, that includes, of course, transportation, which, you know, is difficult. But actually, New York has greater potential for a more the kind of diversified transportation we need than other parts of the country do. So that's a leadership position it could competitively, it could assume if it chooses, uh, New York region. But uh, also, you know, the environment does not operate within political boundaries. It does not even operate within little environments like forests and meadows. It operates in enormous watersheds and uh, sort of ec ecological regions. And so when we think how we're going to do this, we can't forget that the Hudson River doesn't just roll by New York City, it rolls, you know, by Saratoga, where Jim lives. And uh, it goes way upstate, and these are economically unified and environmentally unified landscapes. And to think about them together is the way that we create the opportunities to do the things that we have to do. Okay, what would you do? Uh, New York faces uh, particularly difficult problems, and I want to I want to explain why I think that the skyscraper is a tragic uh, situation, because uh, it's not just about the uh, energy picture per se, or at least not not as directly as you would imagine. Um, th there are, there are a couple of really major reasons that it's uh, tragic. One is a lot of these buildings will never be renovated there'll be one generation buildings and we're not going to be able to fix them. We're not going to have the capital to fix them. We're not going to have capital on the scale of the capital that was uh, behind the construction of them originally. Especially things like the 80-story Frank Gehry condo building, okay? We may not even have the fabricated modular building materials that are necessary to do that kind of renovation. Even things seemingly as mundane as sheetrock because all of these things require vast supply and manufacturing systems which are going to get into trouble. And we are not paying any attention to that. That's the first thing. They will never be renovated. And you're seeing now the product of 30 years of the, the world's greatest 
debt fiesta of racking up the most tremendous amount of, of, of uh, borrowed money. That's why New York is in as good and good shape as it is right now in this moment. This moment will not last forever. The other reason is this. Uh, we've run a lot of experiments in the United States over the last uh, 100 years. One of them, of course, was suburbia, an experiment that is going to come to grief. But another one has been the massive condoization of large structures. We've never deconstructed the rights of real estate like this before on such a mass basis. And we've only done it in a, in a context of increasing growth and increasing wealth. Now that we face a, a context of contracting wealth, we're going to discover that the condo system of, of property division is going to fail. And it doesn't have to fail a lot to fail. You don't need 50% of the condo owners of a given building to fail to pay their mortgages before the homeowners associations can no longer care for the property. Isn't that just called Miami? Is that our cautionary well, tale? Well, Miami was an early instance of that, but, but you know, Miami is going to be small scale compared to the, the failures of the deconstruction of real estate in New York City. It's a horrendous problem that no one is paying any attention to, and it's waiting there, and, it, and I have no idea how we're going to resolve it. Uh, since there has been no intelligent conversation about it, you know, you can't, you can't expect anybody to have come to an intelligent conclusion about it. But for the moment, it's insoluble. The way people have typically moved around is jobs, right? That's why we have the mega cities. 